Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Politics and Prose on this Sunday afternoon at dusk. We're here to celebrate the publication of Mary Elise Serrati's The Collapse. This is an extraordinary day for Mary Elise Serrati to be here. It's November 9th, 2014. It is literally, as you know, I know you know, the 25th anniversary of the collapse of the Berlin Wall. And we have here a remarkable book by a remarkable author. Um, just today, it was named the Book of the Week by Fareed Zakaria, um, which is a rather credible authority. Um, and um, it, it, it is, this is a wonderful story. I've had a chance to read it. Um, it is one, I love this as, as a liberal who's always hearing about unintended consequences. You shouldn't do this step and that step. This is a beautiful story of unintended consequences leading to a peaceful revolution. And, um, and, and with it, this phenomenon that uh, I'm sure will be discussed, the trust among the peaceful revolutionaries. Uh, so this is very different from the French Revolution. And, and Mary Elise asks a very core question. Why did not a system that is responsible repressive to the core, as a repressive system to its core, how come it didn't resist those who were, wanted to um, overcome the wall and, and be free? Um, it is, um, in this book, Mary Elise tries to under, help us understand how the wall opened so we can understand why it opened, and the why becomes very, very, very important. As, as many of you know, I'm Carla Cohen's husband, and I love introducing books here because of the great quality of leadership that comes from uh, her and Barbara Mead's successors, Brad Graham and Lisa Muscatine. And for Carla and me, Berlin was an important place. We were wrapped up with uh, uh, the passion of Ernst Reuter and the Free University in Berlin where Mary Elise studied, um, and, uh, and with Willy Brandt. And I had the pleasure of, of helping shepherd Brandt around in, once in Washington when he was here in the mid-'80s working on questions of, uh, of, of overcoming missile shields and Star Wars and things that were uh, not healthy, and he was working to help overcome it. So in this book, uh, this, this, on this anniversary strikes me as, a, for me, a very important thing personally. And I love the way you worked with the archi archives, and, uh, but above all, not only the memos that historians do, archives, memos, we know they do that. But what Mary Elise uh, Serrati has been able to do is capture the stories of people who are not household names, who risk their lives against a powerful security apparatus. That's an incredible story to understand how it happened and why it happened. So let us welcome uh, today uh, Mary Elise Serrati to Politics and Prose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone so much for coming out here today on this momentous anniversary, the actual 25th anniversary of the fall of the wall. And I'd like to talk about how that opening happened and the way in which it was the result of a sequence of events triggering in perfect but accidental sequence. It's hard to imagine the same result come repeating. If we could somehow rerun the fall of the Berlin Wall over and over again, it's hard to believe it would actually fall again, but it did. So I'd like to talk today about the collapse, the accidental opening of the Berlin Wall. And let me explain by way of background, one of the reasons that I wrote this book was that when I wrote my last book, I kept getting the same question again and again when I would do book talks. 
my last book, 1989, The Struggle to Create Post-Cold War Europe, is actually about the foreign policy that followed the opening of the Berlin Wall. So in that book, which came out in 2009, I just described the fall of the wall in a few pages. And then the whole rest of the book, hundreds of pages, is dedicated to all of the diplomacy and maneuvering that happened afterward. But the same thing kept happening when I would give book talks. I would go places like this and stand up and say, hello, I'm here to talk about the foreign policy that followed the accidental opening of the Berlin Wall. So, and I often would not even get through that sentence. And people would stop me and say, whoa, 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 time out, time out. What do you mean the accidental opening of the Berlin Wall? And sometimes I would get a less uh, pleasant interruption. I would get, don't you know that Reagan opened the wall in 1987? <laughs> When he went to Berlin on June 12, 1987, and spoke in front of the Brandenburg Gate, you're supposed to be a historian. And so the first time I got that question, I, I did what you did, which was that I laughed. But I, I kept getting those questions or some variant of them. And it gradually became apparent to me that I had made a big mistake, that the amazing story of the opening of the wall was just not well known in English. And so I began looking around for a good, if I thought if I couldn't read German, if I hadn't lived in Germany and studied in, in Berlin, what would I read? And I realized there wasn't one good book on the opening of the wall and the anniversary was coming. So that seemed like a call to action. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought that there were there are two interesting questions, which is for what reasons, well, let me put it this way, for what reasons did the wall come down? And what impact does our not knowing this story have on our foreign policy today? Because I think it does have an impact. We have in the United States claimed single-handed authorship of this event. This is a visual representation of that assumption of authorship. It's a statue at the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library in College Station, Texas. And I realize it might be a little hard to see. It's basically gigantic stallions trampling over pieces of the Berlin Wall, which are literally crumbling under their feet. So this shows the, the triumphalist attitude that the U.S. Could, could gallop over the wall. There is a competition, though. There are no, a number of these memorials. They are here in Washington in the Capitol. They're in Fulton, Missouri, where Winston Churchill spoke. They're at the Reagan Library. Here is the Reagan Library Memorial, which is simpler. It's just a panel of the Berlin Wall. That's the kind of thing you can see at the museum. But what's impressive about this memorial is when you think of the eye-watering cost of real estate in Southern California, you realize how much it costs to dedicate an entire hilltop to this memorial. This is part of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. So there's this uh, American sense that somehow we we brought down the wall and that we can uh, do that again. And this was, of course, unfortunately, very pronounced after 9-11 when one started hearing the saying, from Berlin to Baghdad. In other words, we can duplicate the success of democratizing Berlin because we did it, and it was fairly risk-free and fairly cost-free, and we can duplicate this elsewhere. In other words, the United States knows too little about the role of the locals, knows too little about what the people on the ground did to bring about that result. And so that became another motivation to write this book. There's that saying, a success has many fathers. The opening of the Berlin Wall was a big success. And so it has a lot of fathers now. And so I wrote this book to let the actual fathers and mothers of this event speak in their own voices. And these are people you've probably never heard of. But I try in my book to introduce you to them. So let me try in this talk to give you just a little sense. There's many, many more stories in the book. Uh, and then I'll be happy to take questions about this. Now, I can talk about this until everyone in the room loses the will to live. <laughs> because I find it endlessly fascinating. But I will try to keep this fairly short. So the, ba the basic background story, I'll, I'll kind of skim it. But the um, context is important as well. Uh, the book b is based on what political scientists sometimes call a powder keg model. A powder keg model means in order to understand an explosion or some kind of dramatic revolutionary change, you need to understand both the powder keg or the fuel, the longer term causes, and you need to understand the sparks or the catalysts, the shorter term causes. An academic such as myself have been much better at understanding the powder keg than at understanding the sparks. Now, part of the powder keg, the long-term fuel, is, of course, the reforms of Mikhail Gorbachev in the Soviet Union. You see a picture of him here uh, 
when he was Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 1988. So, of course, the long-term competition between the Soviet Union and the U.S. set the context. The competition between communism and markets as ways of organizing modern societies, those are all important. The context helps to shape the... Um, the context helps to create the possibility that the, that the wall can open, but it does not actually open the wall. In order to get the wall open, you have to move beyond elite politicians, such as Vice President Bush, President Ronald Reagan, and Mikhail Gorbachev. And you need to look at the people who are catalysts. And as I was writing this book, an article by a colleague of mine, Richard LeBeau, was very influential. He pointed out that catalysts aren't all alike. They're not like buses. They don't come along every five minutes. We need to actually understand the unique nature of the catalyst as well, because the way they interact with the powder keg helps to shape the explosion. So that was what I was trying to do in this book. I tried to look at the interaction between the elite level and the individual level. The elite level under President George H.W. Bush is surprisingly a uh, almost a classic Cold War story. President Reagan, as many of you will remember, of course, had started meeting Mikhail Gorbachev on a nearly annual basis. But when President Bush came into office, one of the biggest surprises of my research was just how thoroughly he rooted out all the Reagan appointees. The um, scholars who study presidential transitions actually cite the Reagan-Bush transition as one of the nastiest transitions ever. One scholar said Bush fired everybody. In the internal documents I found, Bush appointees referred to, quote, mush for brains Reaganites who had infected various departments and needed to be rooted out. And the main problem was that those, quote, mush for brains Reaganites had fallen under the seductive spell of Gorbachev. And the Bush team thought that was a huge mistake. The George H.W. Bush team thought there were two and only two possibilities. Either Mikhail Gorbachev was, uh, he was not for real, he was trying to lull the United States into a false sense of security, and the United States should keep up its guard. So either he was a fraud, or, second possibility, Gorbachev was for real, he was a genuinely nice guy, he genuinely wanted reforms, but he could be dispatched with a single bullet, and the Soviet Union still had the capability to basically end life in the United States. So either way, the Bush team thought it was an enormous mistake to basically work too closely with Gorbachev. And when Mikhail Gorbachev sent out feelers to President, new President Bush to say how much he was looking forward to continuing frequent summits, the response of the Bush White House was, don't call us, we'll call you. So the Bush administration hit pause and tried to return to a more traditional Cold War standing. But the events from below were anything but traditional in the summer of 1989. Of course, many of you will recall that in the summer of 1989, there were widespread protests, hundreds of millions of people all over China, most notably in Tiananmen Square. You see here, students from the Art Academy have put together the goddess of democracy, obviously an homage to the Statue of Liberty, and she's staring Mao right right in the face here on Tiananmen Square. Now, of course, the goddess of democracy is no longer on Tiananmen Square on the night of June 4th, 1989. The People's Liberation Army fired on the people, used violence to clear the square. To this day, we still don't know exactly how many people died. Uh, there are still many open questions about that tragic event. You see here this famous image, the row of tanks, bravely halted by one young protester who is soon dragged away and the tanks proceed. So I'd like to ask you for the remainder of my talk, which should only take another six or seven hours, <laughs> I'd like to ask you to keep this image in your mind. We all know that the Cold War in Europe ended peacefully, but try to forget you know that, because the dissidents I'm going to describe to you had this image in their mind when they went out on the streets, the images of a communist regime using violence to defend itself. And the question in their mind was, could that possibly be duplicated in Cold War Europe? So this is the map of my childhood. This is the map of Cold War Europe. I realize it might be hard to see from the back. The only thing I'm really trying to show is the... the collision between the orange color, which is the Warsaw Pact, that's the Soviet military bloc, and the green color, which is NATO Europe. And that line between the orange, the Warsaw Pact, and the green NATO runs right between divided Germany. This was Cold War Europe, and the question was, what would the uh, regimes here do? 
Mikhail Gorbachev, as I said, was interested in reforms, but there were many opponents to him inside the Soviet Union, and he had opponents in the Warsaw Pact as well, most notably the uh, Czech and particularly the East German governments. They were not interested in reforms. They were interested in maintaining their hard-line standing. They were horrified when their colleagues in Hungary decided to open the border between Hungary and Austria. Initially, that was only to let Hungarians out, but the Hungarians were shocked when an estimated 200,000 East Germans suddenly showed up in Hungary and said, we want to get out too. <laughs> now, this was problematic because the Hungarians had treaty obligations to the East Germans not to let them out. But at a strategic moment, the West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl contacted the leader of Hungary. The leader of Hungary was in, needed economic assistance, and Chancellor Helmut Kohl said to the leader of Hungary, I will call my very good friends who are in charge of German banks, and they will be good to you if you let people out. And the prime minister of Hungary suddenly decided to let people out, and indeed German Brit banks were very good to Hungary after that. So East Germans start being able to flood out of Hungary into Austria and into West Germany, which truly horrifies the East German ruling regime. And so in response, it, first with Czech, the Czechoslovaks tries to stop its citizens from getting to Hungary at all, but then they end up crowding into the West German embassy in Prague, which is another disaster. So the East German regime seals its borders entirely. And this turns East Germany into a pressure cooker. In particular, East Germans who had been trying to get south, trying to get to Czechoslovakia, get stuck here in the southern part of East Germany, in a region historically known as Saxony. And that region sees a dramatic spike in protests that these people get stuck there on the border. And uh, these protesters are in part inspired by the example, the successful example of solidarity in Poland, but they're not as interested in gradual reform as the Polish leaders had been. They're fed up with their government and they want change now. And so matters come to a head in the Saxon city of Leipzig. Again, I realize it's hard to see, and especially if you're in the back, the tiny type here. What I'm really trying to show here is just this medieval city center. This is a historic medieval city center. Leipzig is a very old city and this ring around it. This used to be the city walls, and they were torn down and a modern multi-lane ring road was put in them, put in instead. This is the main train station, this is the ring road. And what started happening in Leipzig is that leaders of the Nikolai Church protest movement capitalized on this popular disgust at what the government was doing, capitalized on this popular um, revulsion at the ceiling of the borders, and started organizing large protest marches. And what would happen is the protesters would leave the church, collect here on the square, and then try to get around the ring road. And the security forces would try to stop them. And this kept happening again and again, and finally it became apparent on the night of October 9th that there was going to be a showdown. And one of the biggest surprises of my research was that on that night, October 9th in Leipzig, the ruling regime planned a Tiananmen level event. The ruling regime had something in the neighborhood of eight to 10,000 men who were armed. Uh, Kalashnikovs are distributed, bullets are distributed. The um, uh, young police officers are told some of these bullets are for the backs of your heads if you don't obey orders and shout at the crowds. There was a detailed plan laid out. The plan was, if they couldn't stop the protesters coming out of the church, and if they couldn't stop them at Karl Marx Square, to stop them as they went around this bend in the road, because it was kind of a sharp corner, and the protesters would have to slow down. So tactically speaking, it would be a, a good place to open fire, be, have maximum efficacy. So there is this huge protest plan. There was a huge response planned. I really was amazed going through the police records to see that. And there's another factor involved. Some of the dissidents broke off, snuck onto the top of this church, and tried to make a videotape of what was going on. This is a government that has complete censorship, complete control of the media. So if any real news is gonna get out, it's gonna have to be smuggled out. And so these information smugglers, and I interviewed a number of them, felt that their mission was to try to record whatever happened, whether it was a bloodbath or a success. Either way, they wanted to get that information out to the West. Now that was no small thing because the East German secret police or Stasi as a percentage of the population was the largest surveillance organization in recorded history. In absolute numbers, the absolute number of Chinese secret police is of course greater, but as a percentage of the population, the ratio of secret police officers to citizens 
the Stasi, um, the East German population was the most closely watched population that we know of in recorded history. So it was very, very tricky to evade the censors. But they, they managed to do it. They managed to get up there and they managed to start filming. And then on that night, as the protesters started moving, as the troops were ready and waiting to go, the man in charge on the ground got cold feet. The man in charge on the ground, I describe this in the book, was a second party secretary. The second party secretary was normally the deputy to the first party secretary, but the first party secreta secretary on that night miraculously called in sick. <laughs> and the second party secretary began to think, am I being set up here? The second party secretary also wondered, am I going to basically be the one they come after for war crimes after we shoot all these people? He began to get very worried. He also began to get word that there was a coup unfolding among the big bosses in Berlin, that the real hardliner at the top of the East German regime was about to be toppled. And so as the protesters swept up towards the Eastern Knot, for no apparent reason, he suddenly called East Berlin and demanded t to talk to the man who was, in fact, secretly plotting a coup. There was no reason he had to do this. The operational plan was set. The troops were there. The weapons were there. This is completely outside of the deployment plan. But he insisted on calling the number two, a man named Egon Krenz, a man who indeed soon did launch a coup, and saying to him, are we really going to do this? There's 100,000 people here. Am I really going to open fire? And as the protesters are already moving towards the Eastern Knot, Egon Krenz says, I'll call you back. <laughs> You can't make this stuff up. If I put on the cover of this book, <laughs> if I put on the cover of this book, Mary Cerati, The Collapse, a novel, no one would believe it. <laughs> he says, I'll call you back. He doesn't call back. And so the second party secretary, he's watching the crowds get closer and closer. He, see, he feels that he's being left in the lurch. He doesn't want on his own authority to open fire, have 10,000 armed men open fire on 100,000. He's overwhelmed by the size of the, size of the crowds, which is much bigger than he thought. And at the last possible minute, he issues the order to retreat. Unfortunately for many people involved, that order to retreat survives because many of the people interviewed afterwards by state committees investigating crimes uh, said, oh, everything was going to be peaceful that night. We had no plans. We had no plans at all. Well, then why did you need to issue an order to retreat, which happens mere minutes before the protesters get here? Well, the order to retreat is effective. The troops pull back, although they still have orders to attack if they are attacked. So it's very important that the protest stays nonviolent. And the protest leaders work very hard to make sure that it stays nonviolent. And the two smugglers up here, two men named Ziggy Shevska and Ara Murdomsky, whose stories I describe in the book, are able to videotape the crowd as it sweeps around the bend. I interviewed both of them, and they could not believe it when they saw that mass of 100,000 people curving around the bend. They said to each other, if we can make this video, get it past the Stasi, and get it to the West, this is going to bring down the Berlin Wall. And they were able to get the video, to smuggle it out to the West, and I describe how in the book, and to, bring and to help bring down the Berlin Wall. And they weren't wrong, because the population gained an enormous amount of confidence as a result of this event, October 9th in Leipzig. The fact that the, the people had pushed the regime into retreat, number one, and that Ziggy and Aram could film it, get it out to the West, and have it broadcast on Western channels that East Europeans could see. That meant that other people knew about the retreat of the regime. It emboldened protests throughout the country. And that wave of self-confidence, of protest, moves on to Berlin, where it's going to crash up against the Berlin Wall. So this is a picture from the night of October 9th in Leipzig. Uh, People involved said they walked a hundred abreast on that big ring road to the city of Leipzig. This is where you hear those famous chants, we are the people. This is a peaceful revolution in full flower. So it soon, the protests soon move on to the divided city of Berlin. Uh, this is a map from the book. Uh, on the left is West Berlin, composed of the French, British, and U.S. sectors. On the right is the Soviet sector. This thick line is the Berlin Wall, because, of course, West Berlin was an island inside East Germany. Uh, trivia point, West Berlin was the only city with an outline traced exactly in lights and visible from outer space, because the wall was always fully lit at all hours of darkness. Astronauts always knew where West Berlin was. <laughs> And so in order to go from one side of Berlin to another, or to go to East Germany, you had to go through these checkpoints, either these little points here in the center or checkpoints on the outer rim. And the key point 
where the wall is going to open first is this point, Bornholmer Street, in the north of divided Berlin. What happens is that that coup does take place. Egon Krenz, the number two, does oust the top hardliner. He does so because he and his colleagues on the Politburo decide that the hardliner's approach has become self-defeating. He uses violence and more people show up. And he uses more violence and more people show up. And he uses more violence and on October 9th, 100,000 people show up. It was clear where that was going. When he started talking about aerial attacks on his own cities, aerial attacks on Saxon cities. Now remember that Dresden was firebombed in World War II. So that has tragic historical, historical significance to talk about firebombing Saxon cities. That was when Egon Krenz and his coup partners decided to oust the hardliner in charge. So Egon Krenz takes over and he decides he's going to have a different approach. What he's going to do is he's going to talk a good game in public, but not really change anything. So on the night of November 9th, a month later, November 9th, 1989 in Berlin, uh, he has a colleague, a fellow member of the Politburo, announce what are meant to be relatively minor changes to travel regulations. These aren't far-reaching. The state and the Stasi still retain their ability to control the movement of their people absolutely on a whim, to say yes or no, you can go and you can't on a whim. But it's supposed to sound good in public. The problem is it sounds a little too good. There are mistakes made in drafting the press release that I describe in detail in the book. And the Politburo member in charge of announcing it is very arrogant. He doesn't even bother to look at the press release before the press conference. Now, this isn't very surprising because if you're a member of a dictatorial Politburo, you don't need to develop media skills. <laughs> right? You can just, you actually write the headlines yourself after the events. So you don't need to understand how to deal with the media. And so this man had never learned how to deal with the media. And so when he got up, he reads his press release for the first time. It doesn't contain the wording he thought it was going to contain. He mumbles his way through it in confusion, but some words pop out that, short of their context, sound really good. Things like possible to cross the border, possible for every citizen, including West Berlin, and right away, immediately. And he starts reading this press release, and before he even finishes speaking, um, if, if this were the press conference, like the back 15 of you would already run out and start reporting on it. Within a, 120 seconds of his first reading of the document, the wire reporters, those used to be the people who got news out first, are already reporting that the wall is open. So when he tries to backpedal, when he says things like, well, of course this will only go into effect if NATO disarms, it's too late. <laughs> the wire reporters, Associated Press, Reuters have already reported the wall is open. So um, if he's having a bad night, that Politburo member, the people who are about to have a terrible night are the border guards. And here is Bornholmer Street crossing, that crossing that I showed you. I realize the quality of this photo is not great. It's a Stasi aerial photo from the 1980s. The quality of the photo in the original is not, the quality of the photo in the original is also not great. But let me tell you what it is so you can see this picture. Down here is East Berlin. Up here is West Berlin. And this entire area with a bright white wall around it is the checkpoint. It's a huge complex where there are border guards and customs officers and passport officers. It's a number of acres. If you're a pedestrian, you come in and you're processed through one of these buildings. If you're a vehicle or in a car, you drive over here and there are lanes. You have to pull over and have your vehicle searched. And then you're allowed to proceed up here to the final gate, the final checkpoint, the final bridge. So remember this final checkpoint, this final bridge. And finally, right about here, you're in West Berlin. I have another, um, I have another image of this. It's an internal Stasi working graphic of this same site to give you perhaps a better idea. It's a little hard to see. The Stasi weren't always great artists. <laughs> but this, is, this is the internal Stasi uh, working map of Bornholmer Street. Uh, it has basically it has basically the same layout. This is East Berlin down here. This is West Berlin up here. This dotted line is the border. It's not quite to scale because the bridge is shortened. So you come in here. There are service buildings over here. The vehicle lanes are over here. And then you go up to the final checkpoint and the bridge, and you finally get out. And the man in charge on the night of November 9th is this man. This is his Stasi file photo. His name is Harold Yeager. And he is the man who opens the Berlin Wall. It's amazing to me, 25 years later, that 
we don't know this in the United States of America, but this is the man, or we tend not to. Uh, there are some people who know this. But by and large, this man's name is not a household name. This is the man who opens the Berlin Wall. He is a very, very unlikely candidate for this job. He is a loyalist. I pulled as much of his service files as survive in the Stasi archive. He had worked at Bornholmer Street for 25 years. He had served three years before that and had helped to build the wall. I interviewed him twice, and he said that he be he believed then that the wall was tragic but necessary to prevent World War III between the Warsaw Pact and NATO. He then worked, as I said, for 25 years at Bornholmer Street, and in the surviving files that I could find, he had only one minor demerit and a raft of awards for exemplary service. So this was a man who was a real loyalist. This was a man who was still willing to put on his uniform and show up for a 24-hour shift through the night in the fall of 1989. This man believed very much in the system, and so it's very surprising that in the course of this night, he becomes the man who opens the Berlin Wall. So how does this happen? Well, if I can go back to the picture, immediately after the press conference on November 9th, People decide to take advantage of the press conference and run to the wall. Now, I interviewed a number of dissidents, and I thought, before I interviewed them, I thought, oh, this is going to be the highlight of my interview. I'm going to ask them, how did you feel when you heard that press conference? How did you feel when you heard the member of the Pup Bureau say the wall is open? I figured they would say, it was wonderful. I felt that I had my freedom. And as soon as I interviewed these dissidents, they kept saying a similar, similar things. Basically, I said, how did you feel when you heard that press conference? And they said, that man was an idiot. <laughs> That man was an idiot, and we knew the wall wasn't open. We knew he didn't know what he was talking about, but we knew that we could use it. We knew it was leverage. We knew we could go to Bornholmer Street, which was near a dissident, an area where a lot of dissidents lived, and we could say to the border cards at the eastern border crossing at that entry, you should let us out. A member of the Polipero just said, you should let us out, let us pass. We knew that we could make their lives miserable. And so we decided to do that. <laughs> and so uh, this man who was on duty, Harold Yeager, s ha calls into his superiors and says, you know, we've got dozens of people here saying we should let them out. He calls his superior officers and says, do I have new orders? Is there something that I don't know about? And his superiors say, no, business as usual, keep the gate open. And then he calls back a few minutes later. He said, you know, it's getting to be closer to 100 people. Do I have new orders? And his superiors say, no, keep the gates open. And then he calls back and says, there's more people here. He told me that he called 30 times in the course of the night over the next approximately four and a half hours. And he kept getting business as usual, keep the gates closed. There was only one time that he got something different, and that turned out to be crucial. After he'd called about a dozen times, his superior officer said, I'm sick of you calling and asking the same question. I'm going to patch you into a call with my superiors. Just keep your mouth shut so they don't you know you're on the line. But you're here for yourself. There's no change. So Harold Yeager does as he's told. He keeps his mouth shut. He gets patched into the big bosses. And he gets patched in just in time to hear, we're getting these reports from this guy, Jaeger. Is he delusional? Is he a coward? Is this cowardly guy able to report the situation accurately? And suddenly the line goes dead. And he is furious. This is a man who hasn't disobeyed an order in a quarter of a century, and he's being called a delusional coward. And this gets his back up. And he's sitting there fuming, and then the phone finally rings again, for once he gets a call, and his immediate superior says, okay, okay, we have one thing for you to do differently. We think you should go to the eastern border and pick out the biggest troublemakers, the people who are really making your life miserable, the people who are really saying, we want out. Pick out a handful of them, pull them aside, put a stamp on the face of their passport, and let them out. Don't tell them that you have just expelled them forever. <laughs> And if we get rid of the biggest troublemakers, hopefully the rest of the crowd will lose heart and go home. So this idea turns out to be terrible. <laughs> it becomes apparent what the deal is. The crowd quickly figures out the deal. If you get loud, you get out. <laughs> And so you can imagine what starts happening over here. But sure enough, uh, the guards pull aside a dozen or so troublemakers. They stamp 
the faces of their passports. One, two of them are Ziggy Shefka and Aram Radomsky, those men who those men who made the video in Leipzig and smuggled it out. They are definitely troublemakers. Ziggy Shefka's passport, with his face with the stamp over it, is now in a museum in Germany. They get pulled aside. They get let out, and chaos erupts on the eastern side as other people thinking, now here we, here we go, here we go, we're getting out. Chaos erupts. And even worse, a new problem happens, which no one expected. The new problem is on this side of the border crossing, the western side. Among the first group of troublemakers let out uh, were young parents. So most of the people, as expected, like Siggy Shefka and Aram Radomsky, get let out and disappear into West Berlin and are gone for days or longer. But young, these young parents turn around and come right back, and they come back to the Western entry, and they say, here we are again. We just wanted to have a quick look. We left our kids at home in bed. <laughs> and they have stamps over the faces of their passports, which means they have been expelled forever. And so the border guards on this side of the, of the uh, checkpoint say to them, you can't go back. You've been expelled forever. You're never going to see your kids again. And I know this sounds ridiculous, but that's exactly what the construction of the Berlin Wall had done. The construction of the Berlin Wall had suddenly and immediately split parents from their children. And so these young parents don't think this is a joke. These young parents lose it as you can imagine yourself doing in a similar circumstance. And they are overwhelmed with rage and with grief, and they are not taking this, they are not going to accept this. And so the guards on this side of the border call to Jaeger and say, sir, we can't handle this. We need you to come up here. And so Harold Jaeger goes up there. And that, for him, was the crucial moment. He told me that a lot of other things followed, but that, for him, was the crucial moment. He was being left in the lurch by his superiors. He felt that he and his men were being threatened by thousands of angry East Berliners. He had been called a coward. He was also going through a cancer scare. He, dis he did not have cancer, but he thought he did. He had taken a number of tests, and he was actually due to go to the doctor the next day to get the test results. And so on that night, he had a, a different perception of reality. His thinking was, I'm a dead man anyway. So he had a different willingness to address the situation than he might have had at any other night. And this is what I find fascinating. What I'm telling you here is unbelievably detailed. This is micro history, right? But what's amazing to me is the way that these, these sparks or catalysts, these micro details, interact with the powder keg. And that's about to happen. So Harold Yeager goes up there, and he sees these parents who are losing it, and he snaps. Even though he's been given a direct order, these people have been expelled forever, they have the stamps on their faces, he says, you can come back in. And he said for him personally, I, as I said, I interviewed him twice, he said for him personally, that was the key moment from which, from, all, from which all else followed, because he had disobeyed an order. And not that long afterward, more people say they want to come back, and Jaeger says, okay, let them back in. And then more people want to come back, Jaeger says, okay. And then West Berliners want to come east, and Jaeger finally says, forget it, let them all come this way. In other words, he's on the slippery slope of disobedience. And so finally, by about 11.30, he's disobeyed so many orders, he's furious, he feels afraid and alone, and he feels like he's gonna die, and his superiors have left him in the lurch. He basically turns to the men around him and says, either we're gonna shoot all these people or we're gonna open up. And fortunately for the world, at Bornholmer Street, on the night of November 9th, at about 11.30 p.m., this man, Harold Yeager, decides to open up. And here is the result of his decision. So this is Bornholmer Street at about, on, on November 9th, early on November 10th. You see here that final guard post and the bridge, but now overwhelmed by Joy's people crossing. And the media plays a significant role in accelerating events. You can see a man here filming what's going on. Images of the crowds of people flooding out are quickly captured and broadcast. Up until now, there's just been reporters saying the wall is open, people who misinterpreted the press conference, but now the wall really is open. And now there's these, inf these images to confirm that. And this it helps to inspire the other guards at other checkpoints in an ad hoc, uncoordinated fashion to open their checkpoints as well. And there's even crowds flowing across the wall where there is no checkpoint. This is the Brandenburg Gate, and there's no crossing point at the Brandenburg Gate, despite the fact that it's called the Brandenburg Gate. So there, people just go up and over the Brandenburg Gate and overwhelm the wall. Now, 
this sequence of events is still not final. There are elements inside the East German, East German regime who decide to try to reseal the border. And indeed, this area that I'm showing you, the Brandenburg Gate, is actually retaken by the Stasi and cleared by about four in the morning. But fortunately for the peaceful revolutionaries, for the dissidents, the big bosses, particularly in Moscow, the people needed to really organize, organize a large-scale resealing are asleep, are unavailable. And by the time a military tribunal is convened the next morning, by the time uh, military units trained in operations in urban terrain are mobilized, it's too late. Because by then it's not thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people, it's millions of people who are flooding back and forth between the two halves of divided Berlin. So the Berlin Wall, fortunately, stays open. This is the site of Bornholmer Street today. I took this picture. Contrast that in your mind with the triumphalist American memorials I showed you at the beginning of my talk. Th these lane lines here are actually left over from East Germany. So these were the vehicle processing lines at Bornholmer Street. And the reason I took this picture is I heard that the every last trace was going to be ripped out and replaced with a discount grocery store. <laughs> and so if you go now there, you will see a discount grocery store. Yeah, this is the opposite of triumphalism. There have been some information panels that have been installed, but they're of very low quality. This one, I don't even know if you can see, it's supposed to be a picture of the people flooding across the gate, but it's fallen prey to a sticker someone's put on it and peeled off. It's fallen prey to weather. Uh, it's no comparison to the American statues. Now, this is not a bad thing. The world gets a little uncomfortable when the Germans celebrate their, their victories a little too triumphantly. I actually prefer this low-key approach to the very triumphant approach because I said at the outset of my talk, assuming authorship without recognizing the importance of the locals is not only historically wrong, it's also dangerous for your own foreign policy. So I'll close with a quotation from this woman. It was one of the most moving quotations that I heard while I did my interviews. This woman's name is Mariana Bertler, and she was a dissident, a church activist in East Germany. And she, after Germany unified, became head of the Stasi archive. That's a very important post in Germany. The first head of the Stasi archive, a man named Joachim Gauck, is now actually president of the whole country. Mariana Bertler was the second head of the Stasi archive and an important politician in her own right. And when I went and I interviewed her, she said, you're, you're, you're writing this book for, for, um, for Westerners, right? For English-speaking audiences, for Westerners. I said, yes, absolutely, that's what I'm doing. And she said, I'm really glad you're doing that. She said, again and again, I meet Westerners, and they assume that somehow... They opened the wall, and that gave us our freedom. And it's the other way around. First, we fought for our freedom, and then, because of that, the wall fell. Thank you very much for your attention. Mary Elise, you tell a great story, but I want to tell everyone you also write a great story. And, um, and uh, the, um, I was so struck by what you said about the, the story of locals. And the fact is the, the revolutionaries, the dissidents, couldn't have worked together if they hadn't been working together, if they hadn't been working together for quite a while. And when uh, Carla led the first international trip that Politics and Prose did, it was to uh, Berlin and the former communist countries. Uh, and we met with some of the East Berliners who had chosen to stay in East Berlin and did not try and escape, but were really, uh, they were church people um, and uh, church activists, and they were working to help try and create some space within East Berlin. So they weren't part of Stasi, they weren't part of it, the, the regime in any way. In a very repressive society, they were trying to create space to help change, to change things. And I think they, they were part of what was the brave effort in, in opening up the wall. So this is, we're ready for the question period. Uh, you know the, um, the routine. I see people standing at the microphone and, and we will, um, we will begin with the first first question, and and um, and we'll rotate the microphones. And Mary Elise, you'll say, take. You know the drill, but I don't, because this is my first time here. Do I do I alternate microphones? Just alternate microphones. Alternate microphones. So we'll start with the Sir, anyway. I, uh, 
Thank you for the talk. It was Thank really you. fascinating. Thanks for coming. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to the book because I remember it, it brought back 25 years ago when you would turn on the TV mm -hmm. and, and open the newspaper and you just couldn't believe what you were reading. Um, Neither could the border guards. <laughs> what, what I wanted to ask was, um, uh, are, do you think at this stage, are there still questions to be answered about uh, what ha how this happened and why it happened? And if so, are there still archives that would need to be opened and where are they? There, well, there's always more to be said, but I, uh, um, I was surprised. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'd, I'd previously written a book about the elite responses, the sort of high politics of foreign policy that followed this, this event. And as I described at the outset, when I would talk about that book, it became, became apparent that this story was not well known in the U.S. And so I thought, I will write this book. It'll be a quick book. I know this story really well. I there's, I, I know all I need to know about this. This will be a quick book. Famous last words. When I actually started researching it, it turned out to be so much more complex than I had imagined. I had not known that there was planning for a Tiananmen-level event in Leipzig in October, and I thought I was an expert on this period. And I had also not fully realized who the heroes of the story were. Uh, I had prior to this worked on, as I said, you know, political leaders, presidents, things like that. And I realized if I were going to write a book about the causes of the opening of the wall, and I were just going to talk about political leaders, it would be a very short book because no one decided to do it. There wasn't a causal story at the elite level. So then I thought, well, why don't I flip it and make it a book about kind of the broader population and how it wanted the wall to come down and the um, how that brought the wall down. And then I realized that wasn't a causal explanation either because the broader population, as far as I can tell, had wanted the wall to come down from the minute it was built, and yet it didn't come down. So that's not a very causal explanation. So I gradually realized I needed to write the history of the middle, people who don't usually feature in histories, people like deputy, you know, deputy border guards like Harold Yeager or mid-level interior ministry officials who mess up the wording of the regulations or these information smugglers or television producers, the crews, why they reported the wall was open when it was not. And so this is very much a book about the people in the middle, the people who are caught up in the sweep of history, but because of the decisions they make that night actually change the course of events. And so I think whenever you examine something in a serious way on the basis of evidence, as I did with this, you realize your assumptions don't work. So I think there's always something new to be written about it as long as you're willing to take the time to go to the sources and speak to the people who are involved. There, there'll always be new aspects that you can find, I think. So now I go to this microphone. Is that how it works? Sir. Well, I'm fascinated <coughs> with this, uh, your story here. And what begs in my mind is, were there any good Western reporters, or was anybody on to this? Were there any good stories? I mean, I have to go back and look at this kind yeah. of stuff, you know, but now I think it just totally missed. Did we all just totally miss this? Well, we tend to assume that great events have great causes, right? We like to assume that there's, uh, there's intentionality, agency, a plan, right? It's easier to understand than a lot of random complex accidents. So, uh, and the, the other factor is that after this happened, a number of people said, oh, yes, I opened the wall. Agon Krenz has said a number of times in a number of forums, oh, yes, I issued an order to open the wall. <laughs> the problem is that that order does not survive, right? And what does survive are dozens and dozens and dozens of border officials saying, what just happened? Why do we have no orders? The next day, there are thick files of border guards and Stasi officers saying, what did you do to us? You left us out there. On the front lines, uh, with no instructions and no orders, we had to face tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. We had no orders. This was not planned, right? So there's tons and tons and tons of that kind of evidence, and there's no evidence that there was an order. But not everyone goes to the original sources, right? So Aegon Krentz gives up, goes, stands up, gives an interview, says, I opened the Berlin Wall, and then it gets gradually into history books. Uh, I actually spoke at the museum yesterday, and I was horrified to see in their Berlin Wall gallery. There's a panel that says the East German regime decided to open the wall. I thought, oh, I thought, I thought, how many copies of my book can I leave scattered around this exhibit? <laughs> I mean, this is, a, that's in some ways a separate question, which is how myths first get generated and then perpetuated. Um, there were, on your question about the media, I, I, I mean, I, I would say this because I wrote the book, but you should buy the book. <laughs> it has a lot of stories. Basically, the people I talk about in the book, they're all representatives of a category. Basically, what I've done, I've only given you a taste of that here because I've only talked about, you know, Harold Yeager and Ziggy Shefka and Armadomsky. But in the book, I pick about 10 to a dozen people 
And they're each a representative of a category that was important. So Harold Yeager is a loyalist. Ziggy Shefka, Ziggy and Aram are dissidents. But I also pick journalists. Uh, I pick Westerners. So I pick about 10 people, and I try to show how their actions, many of them unintentional, all come together on the night of November 9th to contribute to the opening of the wall. And the reporters are a very significant part of that story. They are often making the news that they're covering. For example, at that press conference that I mentioned, the Put Bureau spokesman, the member of the Put Bureau, didn't mean to say the wall is open. In fact, he didn't say that. If you go back and watch the videotape of the conference again and again, he never says the wall is open. When someone stands up, a man stands up, imagine, you know, someone who stood up in the back and said, what is going to happen to the Berlin Wall? He says it so loudly, the whole room falls silent. The, the spokesman says, oh, it's 7 o'clock, press conference is over, sorry. It's, it's a hysterical moment. Um, but despite that, the press still reports that the wall is open. So the press actually helps to create that event by reporting on it. So I realize that's an unsatisfactory answer, but I hope if you look at the book, you'll see that I've shown in more detail the importance of Western reporters in this story. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm old enough to remember how confused I was <laughs> uh, by the hour by hour reports yeah. that were coming out. Yes. Yeah. Some journalists were trying very hard uh, to make sense of it, but we were all confused, I think, for a while. Yeah. Uh, but I do have one. Uh, I do have one concern uh, about uh, the book, uh, based on your comments so far, that I'll put in the form of a question, and that is. Do you acknowledge that Reagan and Thatcher and uh, the Pope and Lech Walesa and others created an atmosphere mm -hmm. in Eastern Europe and uh, to some extent the rest of Europe uh, that made for the first time they made the uh, uh, the fall of the wall and the collapse of communism conceivable they made it Thinkable. And I would argue that it was that change in the mindset that made those micro events, which I'm so eager to read about, those micro events you're describing, um, uh, possible. The guy in Leipzig who suddenly hesitates. Why does he hesitate in 1989? He, because the Reagans and the Thatchers have changed the whole uh, gestalt in a way. And so I, I would really, I hope your book addresses that. Because I remember in, in 1980, the, uh, the fall of communism seemed so far away. And I, I only started thinking about the fall of communism as something possibly imminent in 88 or 89. Yes, that is a, a huge part of the story, and that's why I mentioned the powder keg model. The kinds of factors that you're describing are important in creating the context in which the wall can open. They create the potential for the wall to open, but they don't actually open the wall. Exactly. That's, so what I'm really interested in is the interaction between, as I said, the interaction between the longer-term causes and the catalysts or the sparks. And since the longer-term causes are better known and have been better studied, academics are generally better at studying that kind of thing. That's why in this book I emphasize the role of the catalyst in bringing that actually to fruition. So let me move on to another question. Uh, first of all, I'm very excited to read yes. uh, your, yeah. your book. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, I spent uh, a year in Berlin studying and working, and I was fascinated by some of these questions as well. Yeah. And so I took every opportunity possible to ask my professors, cab drivers, what did you think <laughs> when this happened? You know, I wasn't Who gave around. the better answers, the professors or so, the cab drivers? <laughs> so so what, what I actually, what I, what I found was people would give almost, uh, not an identical line, but something they would say over and over and over again, a variation of, we missed an opportunity to mix the best of the East and West. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and so I wanted to ask you, uh, with some of the uh, some of the research you did with the dissidents, mm -hmm. what were they thinking on November 9th? What, what did they think a unified Germany would be? Or what do they think their lives would hold? Are they disappointed mm -hmm. today? Yeah. That actually is a topic I address more in detail in my previous book. In, in, in my next life, when I have perfect hindsight, I'll write these books in the correct order. <laughs> because it's, in essence, the collapse is the, prequel, is the prequel to the previous book. So the collapse is about the revolution from below, and my other book, 1989, is about the reaction from above. And so that what you're talking about is something that I deal more with in 1989. Briefly, uh, a number of the dissidents involved in bringing down the wall were horrified by what followed. 
A number of them, for example, were pacifists. And being a pacifist, especially for a young man in East Germany, meant having your future canceled. If you refused to do mandatory military service, you were not going to go to college. You were going to be assigned a job as a janitor, and you're going to be assigned an apartment hours away from your job as a janitor, right? I mean, there was a significant, there was a non-trivial cost of being a pacifist in East Germany, especially for the young men, and yet these guys were pacifists. And so once the wall came down, their thinking was not, great, let's become part of NATO. Their thinking was the only suitable response to these dramatic developments to the fall of the wall and going farther back to the the only proper way to live in the shadow of the Holocaust is to demilitarize Central and Eastern Europe. And indeed, some dissidents even said we should dissolve the borders between Central and East European states and create a neutral demilitarized bridge zone between East and West. And they said, you know, we didn't make our revolution so we could be part of NATO or any military pact. I mean, they're not happy about the Warsaw Pact either. And uh, they, of course, uh, ran into intense opposition in Washington, right? So there were a number of dissidents. And then there's also other, there's other reasons they're unhappy. They didn't, uh, one dissident said to me, um, it, Aldi is a discount sh- store like Walmart. She said, you know, the wall came down too soon because all people were going to do is go to Aldi. We wanted to, you know, remake democracy and have new forms of social governance. So, yes, there are absolutely all kinds of dissidents who were then very disappointed with the consequences. But on the other side, but it, it needs to be said, there was one and only one free national election in East Germany after the wall came down. And in that one and only one free national election, voters chose overwhelmingly to rapidly join the West on Western terms. So when the matter was put to a free vote, an overwhelming, uh, well, I should say a sizable plurality and, and and a sizable plurality voted for parties representing rapid unification on Western terms. And it seems fairly clear that a majority of the population favored that. So this dissident view was a minority view. But it sounds like you got wind of that dissident view in your time there. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, You said almost immediately people started going from west to east as well as east to west. And I was wondering if that uh, was kind of risky or if they thought that might be kind of risky in case this all turned around in 12 hours. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, did you talk to any of those people to see what they were thinking? I did. Yeah, I talked to a man. um, uh, I I talked to uh, a West Berliner who was one of the first to try to go from west to east. And he was one of the very first to get from west to east. And he, this was before the wall had really opened. So the chronology events is that the press conference is 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, Harold Yeager opens up first at 11.30. The other border crossings start to open later. So in fact, the, this anniversary is only barely today, November 9th. Right. It starts at 1130, November 9th. Most of the border crossing takes place in the wee hours of November 10th. So there's this long stretch between 7 p.m. and 1130 p.m. where the media is reporting that the wall is open, but it's not. And it's in that time period that he manages to get across and he gets to East Berlin. He's amazed. He gets to some streets that are just quiet. And he said he just started ringing doorbells and just started saying, pounding on doors and saying, come out, the wall is open, the wall is open. And uh, he forgot, there were a few people in the street kind of willing to run around with them, but not many. And so finally they give up kind of ringing doorbells madly. And they finally just decide to go to the Brandenburg Gate because they can't figure out what else to do. And they get to the Brandenburg Gate. And by that point, they're starting to be Stasi officers deploying. And they start to wonder if this was actually such a good idea. <laughs> and uh, they, you know, end up having this kind of running cat and mouse game with Stasi officers, and they end up retreating and going back to West Berlin. So, yes, there was definitely some question in his mind of whether or not that was such a great idea. The irony is that it appears that there's some footage of this young man and his group, it's a little unclear, being brought filmed from the West. And, of course, the Westerners are saying that they're East Germans. <laughs> playing cat and mouse with the Stasi, but in fact, it's this West Berliner who's come all the way around. So it's just one of those many amazing events that happened that night. Yes. So uh, one of the uh, sad ironies of, of this day is that, you know, a half century before yeah. was Kristallnacht. And yeah. so you had this interesting, I guess, in my mind, combination. So mm-hmm. it's kind of a two-parter question here. Yeah. Uh, first, how is that duality dealt with in Germany and Berlin? And also, how were... Uh, Stasi officers and people associated with Stasi held accountable in comparison to like their grandfathers who were in the SS. Hmm. Yeah, the, uh, he's referring to the so-called Kristallnacht, a uh, major Nazi pogrom against Jews that also happened on this date. Yeah, that's the reason that today is not a ho- among other things. Today is not a holiday. 
in Germany. The day of German unification is October 3rd. All right. Uh, German celebrating on November 9th would be in very poor taste. And uh, that's why it's not, even though it's you know a momentous day, and right now there are amazing celebrations going on in Berlin. I assume you've seen some of the pictures on CNN and things like that. The Germans have to be very careful about how they celebrate this anniversary. I think that also is part of the reason why the... Um, as I, as I showed the sort of monuments at Bornholmer Street, well, there aren't monuments. There are these sort of modest memories. The Germans now today, and, and, and this I think is, is very praiseworthy, believe more in sort of smaller memorials, more understated memorials. Uh, the main sort of art event today in Berlin are lighted balloons that are floating up to the sky. As many of you, I'm sure, have seen in the press, the idea that these are lighted balloons. They're where the wall used to stand, and the idea is that the wall is lifting itself. So I think that the um, fact that this is coincidentally that same night has uh, muted the way that it is celebrated and that that's not a bad thing. And I'm sorry, your other question was? Uh, yeah. That, yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a difficult, tricky question. Obviously, you have the war context versus the peacetime context. And um, comparative dictatorial studies are one of the flourishing fields. That actually goes back to the gentleman who asked me, is there more to study? That's a flourishing field now, comparative dictatorship studies, the ways in which there are parallels and similarities. It's a little tricky for me to answer that in a, in a brief way that won't be sort of oversimplified, but, but you, it is an important question. Yes. Hi. Having been there in a green uniform, aware there's a large Soviet, there was a large Soviet garrison yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about why, what at the tactical level? I'm not talking about Gorbachev. Yeah. Yeah. Although mm -hmm. I'm sure he was involved in this somehow. Yeah. But at the tactical level, what were the commanders doing? They sort of sat in their concerns and nothing, nobody moved out to, to quell this. Yeah. So can you speak about that a little bit? Sure. Absolutely. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to talk about that. Yeah. Um, the it's not just the garrison; it's also the Soviet embassy. The highest political authority in East Germany is the Soviet embassy. Now, this is not, you know, in the Constitution, right? This is all, you know, unofficial, but, this, but that is the case, right? Everything of any importance has to be agreed with Moscow, and the usual way to do that is via the Soviet embassy. And so what I did is I tried to interview as many people as possible who were there in the Soviet embassy through these events. It's, it's difficult to work in... Russian and Soviet sources, although thanks to the work of two people who are here tonight, Tom Blanton and Svetlana Savranskaya, we know a lot of this. And so thank you for your efforts in getting Russian and Soviet sources out so scholars such as myself can use them. But despite heroic efforts on the part of Tom and Svetlana, it's often very hard to have Russian documents. So I tried to interview the people who were working at the Soviet embassy that night. Uh, one is Igor Maximichev, who's now retired, and the other is Vladimir Greenin, who is currently the Russian ambassador to Berlin. So I actually interviewed Ambassador Greenin in the very building, the now Russian embassy, then Soviet embassy, on the main street, Unter den Linden in Berlin, right in sight of the Brandenburg Gate, where these events had happened. And he said, yes, oh, of course, the members of the Politburo were here every day. You know, in those dramatic months, they had to get everything approved. We, you know, it was like a revolving door. We saw them all the time. And we were in regular touch with the bases because we were wondering what was going to happen, too. At this point, Soviet authority is collapsing. And even though you have Mikhail Gorbachev in charge, and he's a reformer, the military is full of opponents. I was just at an event on the council. I was at an event at the Council on Foreign Relations last weekend with former high-level participants in events, and one of them said, "You know, Soviet generals said to me our biggest mistake was not shooting Gorbachev on the tarmac in December 1988, when he came back from New York, where he'd given a speech at the UN unilaterally gutting the Red Army. So there were military commanders who were very upset, and uh, at, at the top level." And then at the garrison level, you had very, very unhappy Soviet occupation troops. They were not being paid regularly. Their buildings were in terrible conditions. They were selling off guns and, and bullets, and in one recorded case, a tank on the black market. Uh, you know, it's not clear that they're going to obey orders. They're unhappy. They have guns. They have weapons. And so the Soviet embassy was concerned that the troops might spontaneously do something without orders. So there's sort of two things that can go wrong. Either you can get a really stupid order or you can get really stupid actions. And so the Soviet embassy was very concerned. And uh, then there's another player, which is the KGB, the biggest KGB outpost 
other than inside the Soviet Union itself, was in East Berlin, in Karlshorst. So you've got a number of armed players who could potentially have done something. And the sort of brains, the nexus of this, of the Soviet presence, is the embassy. So I interviewed the, the, the number two and the number three at the Soviet embassy, and I said, what did you do that night? And they said, you know, the ambassador had already gone to sleep by the time it really started happening. Again, even the hour that the wall opens is important, right? Because the ambassador was a hardliner. But he had gone to sleep by, you know, midnight one in the morning when things get really crazy on the streets. And the number two and the number three, they kind of looked at each other and said, are we going to wake everybody up? What's going to happen? Right. I should add, their job was not to provide minute by minute reporting. That was the KGB's job. So the minute by minute reporting was done by the KGB. Their job was to say if political action was needed. And they decided to do nothing send a cable or anything? They sent nothing. They basically, I mean, who wants to be the guy who cables the big boss? You know, the country's falling apart, right? Then they were frozen, and they didn't know what to do. And by the time it was, you know, 2, 3 in the morning, they thought, you know, it'll be morning in Moscow soon enough. (laughs) And everybody will call us then. And they weren't wrong. (laughs) And as soon as it was morning in Moscow, they told me the phone started ringing off the hook. And as soon as it stopped ringing, as soon as they finished a call, they put it down, it rang again. And they said it was always the same. Was that agreed with us? Was that agreed with us? And they decided their line in response, which they just repeated for the whole next day, was that was not agreed with us, maybe with somebody in Moscow. (laughs) We're going to take everyone who's in line to ask a question. So everyone will get their chance, and then we'll close. This isn't really a question. Actually, it's, it's so a we note. have to go over to this oh, side, sorry, though. We have sorry. To, yeah. Oh, please, go, yeah. go, go ahead. He yielded. Since, go, no, I yield. He, he I, yielded. I, to I yield. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, then. I have a question about October 9th in Leipzig. I remember seeing the pictures from the protests, and I wondered then in what I thought at the time was an essentially atheistic communist society how pastors could organize 100,000 people. Okay. Did you interview the pastors, yeah, and, okay. and mm-hmm. what did they say about how that part okay. happened? Yep. The short answer is yes. But I can say something about that. <laughs> yes. This is a mini uh, contribution to history. I was in the then U.S. Embassy in East Berlin ch- waiting to meet the ambassador, and I was chatting with a gentleman who had been a United States Army green uniform in Berlin at the time. And he said that he, in uniform, was on the other side of the wall, and there was a large group of people, a lot of noise, et cetera, and he heard something, and then he began to realize what it was. It was an old lady standing there singing the American national anthem to a United States soldier. <laughs> and I thought I'd just like to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, were there more questions over here? No, I think so. No? Okay. Any more questions over there? No? No. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Well, thank thank you for that memory. One of the great things about this project is that uh, I was able to combine archival work with discussions with people who were there. As an as a academic historian who works a lot with high-level records, often you have this enforced waiting period before you can get going. Many states keep their records closed for 25, 30, 40, 50 years, or, or even longer, as Tom and Svetlana know. And it becomes hard to really tell a detailed story without access to those records. But East Germany and many East European countries were a special case. In East Germany's case, for example, East Germany ceased to exist in 1990, so it couldn't keep its documents closed anymore. And the authorities in unified Germany decided to open the documents up to yesterday. So when East Germany ceased to exist in 1990, the archives opened up to 1990. It was possible to write a high-quality history of yesterday based on primary sources, which is almost never possible if you're a serious scholarly historian, which is one of the reasons why I decided to do this, because it seemed like such a rare opportunity. I mean, become a historian, not just this book. This is my fourth book. I've been doing this for a long time. And um, uh, so you, number one, were able to do high-quality research on the day before yesterday. And number two, by doing that, you put yourself in a great position to interview the participants in events. 
right? It's a really unusual case. Uh, you can both read the documents, but also interview the people who were there and people who have personal memories, such as yourself, and they really reinforce each other well. I, I began to think of it as oral history with teeth, because I would interview people, and many of them would say, oh, yes, I gave an order to keep things peaceful. I gave an order to pull back. I was a hero. And then I would go to the Stasi files and realize, yes, you were a hero to the Stasi. And so of the dozens and dozens of interviews that I did, and there's a list in the back of the book, the stories that I chose to really flesh out and, and bring to the audience are the stories that checked out in the sources. Dissidents I interviewed who said, yeah, I was interrogated that day, I was in solitary that day, and then I could find in the Stasi archive records that, yes, that person was interrogated in, in solitary that day. And it you know, it gradually became apparent to me which people were really accurate and which people really weren't. And so this was just this amazing story. It's this successful, peaceful revolution. It, it, a peaceful revolution happened in East Germany, and it succeeded, and it left behind itself a magnificent collection of sources and people to interview. Even if you don't care about East Germany, uh, I think as human beings, we care about peaceful revolutions and how they succeed. And this is a great way to study how it happened. So this was a really special project, and I'm sorry it's, it's done. On October 9th, a more specific question. Yeah, that's a, another very interesting aspect. October 9th, the role of pastors in the church. That was more complex than I thought as well. The church in the... The, and, and when I say the church, I generally mean the Protestant church, because East Germany was heavily Protestant. The Protestant church uh, played a kind of ambiguous role. On the one hand, uh, everyone knew that dissidents met there. And so Stasi agents uh, conducted a great deal of surveillance on churches, and it became apparent after the wall came down, after the files opened, that a number of pastors had betrayed their own flocks. Ministers had worked as Stasi agents. So uh, there was a, a betrayal of trust. This also has become apparent in Poland and other places as well. It's one of the most painful aspects of the post-Cold War era. So on the one hand, there was a betrayal of trust. Uh, when I interviewed the dissidents, this, this was not a surprise to them. I said, you know, they said, no, we knew we were being watched. We knew we were being infiltrated. We consciously decided to be naive and just try to move forward anyway, because otherwise we wouldn't have accomplished anything. The internal Stasi records on this suggest that the Stasi decided to let the protest movement in the churches continue because it made observation easier. If they drove them out, of, if, they, if, they, if they all met at the church, then the Stasi agents knew where to go. If they drove them out of the church, they were going to have to track them down. It was going to be a pain. So the Stasi knew but tolerated the church, and the dissidents knew but tried to move forward anyway. But the flip side is that there were then pastors who genuinely supported the dissidents, and this caused a lot of frictions inside the church. That's one of the components of my story, is actually friction inside the Nikolai church between the pastors who wanted to support the dissidents and the pastors who didn't. And so the dissidents I spoke to said, on the whole, the churches helped us because they provided us with shelter. And we knew it didn't come, we knew it came with costs. We knew there were bad apples. We knew we were being spied on. But on the whole, the church really helped us because it gave us shelter. It gave us a place to meet. And as long as we weren't, you know, as long as we kept our eyes open and knew what was happening, we could take advantage of that. So it's a complex story, uh, but an important one, an important part of the story. So thank you so much. I, I sense I'm being yanked away.